Please welcome to the show, Ashley Judd. Thank you, George. Hello, Thanks How so are you? much. Welcome. Hi, everybody. How are you? I'm quite well, thank do you. you have a, um, do you have an inappropriate ringtone, or is it a good ringtone on your phone? Uh, I never have the ring on. You never have it on? Very rarely. Well, thanks for coming, and, and congrats on the TV show. I mean, thanks very much. It's a different headspace to get into to have to make a show now, as opposed to being able to do a movie here and do a movie there. Well, the show, this show in particular, was very much like shooting a feature. It was all on location for four and a half months throughout Europe, including Asia, because Istanbul, of course, yeah. straddles. And that's part of what appealed to me, because I have a very wonderful and rich life. I'm not willing to give up my work, particularly in feminist social justice, um, international human rights. So I wanted something where my schedule could be a little bit more manageable and known. Okay, this is what I'm doing for right. 2012. It's a, it's a hell of a twist, too, because you, you start watching the, you know, in, in the first episode, and there you are, being a mother, excited for your kid, and all of a sudden, boom, CIA agent, ass-kicking drama steps in. I had, I've, I've received the DVDs. And I uh, had some friends over to watch the pilot and episode two, and I was really pleased because they did ooh and ah in all the right places. Did they? The writing really worked. <laughs> the, um, and we all cried at the end of two. I'm, I'm crying with my over my own acting. I mean, the, really? van the vanity is unbelievable. Is that allowed? Is that like, are you allowed to do that? In my house, yes. You are. It's, it's <laughs> Dario weeps over his beautiful races. Oh, that was a good laugh. <laughs> and I cry over my own scenes. Whenever you're interviewed post race, you seem to know what you're talking about. When it comes to racing, where did you learn? Let's not shatter the myth. <laughs> Just stop right there. <laughs> yeah, that was um, Homestead. Yeah. It was the last race of the season. He won on the last lap, uh, fighting the great Scott Dixon, who eventually went from foe to teammate. And uh, he won literally in the last corner of the last lap. It, it's great to watch watch Dario Franchitti race, but it's interesting to watch you watch a race because obviously because you're you're celebrity and you know and you're, you're related to him. Now you. When they cut to you, it's not like watching somebody you love succeed at something. There's also this anxiety and fear that exists. Do you have a palpable fear before every race? I would like to think that I don't have fear because that would be a terrible way to live. I chose to opt out of the fear at the very beginning when I signed on for this way of life, you know, which for him is non-negotiable and he demonstrated a canny ability for it about the age of three. Mm -hmm. um, but I do... I feel tension about him winning because I want him to have success at the greatest level. It's, it's such a beautiful, fickle, temperamental, frustrating, glorious sport. And herein lies the really interesting um, part of the portrait that is your life. So you have this career that you can kind of pop in and do the work that you want to do. You've got this TV series. You've got this whole auto racing life that's a part of your life as well. And then there's this thing in the middle, which I think is what drives you, which is the other stuff, which is the... Humanity, the advocacy, essentially, yes. is what it is in your life. I mean, was it all, like, where did it come from, any, the, the, the interest in this? I believe I always had it. I think that it's probably something with which I was born. And for some reason, as a kid, I had an extreme sensitivity to any kind of injustice. And the day in the life of a child is very different from the lay, a day in the life of an adult. And I, in my own way, had a lot of griefs and traumas, and so, Healing from that is a part is a is a core part of my life, and I think in my own woundedness, I was drawn also to the woundedness of the world. Right. And through doing that advocacy work, found my own healing, now have mastery over my own trauma, and hopefully thus serve more effectively. Mastery over your own trauma is interesting because it doesn't mean you erase the trauma. It just Absolutely means not. you're controlling your trauma, or, or basically managing it. Yes. You know, trauma is really interesting because you do, I think, I believe you have to get it out of the body because it exists in the very cells. So there's specific work for that. And then it becomes, wow, I survived the dark night of the soul. How dare I not share this message? So when you write about it in your book, it's one thing to tell your story, but when your story is actually other people's story too that you're telling, mm -hmm. what's the process like of letting those in your life know, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write this. Well, for me, it really involves going back to what we were saying a minute ago about really doing my own work and getting clear. So when I tell my story, because I've taken the charge out, I'm able to give a description. This is what it was like for me, rather than make it an indictment. This is what you did wrong. Right. And in that, there is a world of difference. And I believe I was powerless over my childhood, but the coping strategies that I developed to survive all of which were creative and brilliant and got me through, as an adult, those became my defects of character. 
those became, you know, my shortcomings, control and all that kind of stuff. And that's my responsibility. I was a blameless child in what happened in the home. I take responsibility for my behaviors as an adult. And it's great to have, you know, the freedom to admit that and move on. Um, a big part of the, the humanitarian, the advocacy work you do involves family planning and contraception. Absolutely. And that, and that is, I mean, that's beyond just the idea of feminist uh, justice. That's the idea of just human rights. Absolutely. I was curious what you would think about this conversation that's happening with the Republican race now, you know, about contraception. I find it puzzling, and um, I, I, I think you said it perfectly. We each have the right to regulate our own fertility according to what is appropriate for our lives. And a lot of poor people especially are denied access, and I don't understand why someone else thinks it's their right to encroach or constrain that. And some of the language around it is fascinating. Santorum, Rick Santorum has become, you know, Jokes aside, has an elevated base. People support him. That's what you do when there's a bad guy. You go, <laughs> come on. But is, but is he the bad guy? Because that's a value that a lot of people have. Um, I was trying to make light of it because yeah. it's it's um, it's, it's, it's below meriting com comment. It's. I mean, I'm I'm puzzled by the country I live in at times and the things that are said and when. Family planning was finally being um, provided for certain women uh, in the health care plan, and I celebrated that in a, in a tweet. I said, I can't believe that it's actually taken this long, and I'm really happy about it. The people who disagreed with me were largely women. Yeah. And that, to me, is nothing less than internalization of the patriarchy, and that's what happens. We are victimized in some way without necessarily knowing it, and then we, in, we internalize the perpetrator and become our own abusers. In this situation, a lot of the people who agree with him, and, and certainly from his place, he, he talked about the idea of Christian values, and I know that for you, a lot of your advocacy also had its roots in Christianity. So it's just a really complicated way and completely opposite ways to approach faith. And he doesn't have a corner on the faith market because I'm sitting here as a lifelong Christian, a person who was raised in churches and went to Sunday school and I still choose the God of my understanding as the God of my childhood. I have to expand my God concept from time to time and you know particularly I enjoy um, native faith practices and, and have a very um, nature-based God concept. I'm ju I like to think I'm like St. Francis in that way, brother donkey, sister bird. You and dogs with you everywhere you go. And kitty cats. <laughs> you know, and I'm a Christian and I believe in family planning. And there you go. The two are not mutually exclusive. It's fantastic. <laughs> 1991, that's, you were basically, it was a prophecy. You were talking about what would happen when Angry Birds came out. <laughs> <laughs> and just the intense addiction to this game. Yes. Even flight attendants now, they say, turn off your angry birds. They That's don't incredible. say, go around on your devices, turn off angry birds. So speaking of the Star Trek, how often do you have a, do you think of your long lost love, Wesley Crusher? <laughs> well, you know, those, I think that to be most accurate, they're Trekkers, not Trekkies. You're Trekkies. You're tre are they you're, Trekkies you're or are they Trekkers? You're a Trekker. The Trekkies were the first one. I think about them every time they tweet me, which is often. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, does marrying a race car driver make you a better driver in the streets or more of a maniac on the streets? Uh, it makes me a very comfortable passenger. I never have to drive anywhere. <laughs> um, you just had your 10th anniversary. Did you give him something made out of tin? Ten, tin is 10, right? I did. Um, we love our animals, as you know, and Dario is a very proud papa of an incredible little pussy cat who's completely... Dario Frank, he's a cat person? Oh, he's such a cat person. <laughs> And he is bewitched by this one little cat. And what? so I had a professional photographer come and photograph her all over the house and up in the trees because she's wild. Right. And then took one of those and had it painted, and it's in a tin frame. In a tin frame! <laughs> now, every time I see him take a turn at an ungodly speed, I'm going to think about the cat. At he least is, too. Not even a Rottweiler guy. Gives inspiration. Um, your undergrad degree in French, accurate? Mm -hmm. What's your favorite French word? Why does swear word always come to mind? 
That would be Always. that would be the correct yeah. answer. <laughs> Which is your favorite swear word in French? I don't know. I can't think. You know what? Cyrielle. Cyrielle. Because um, Cyrielle Claire is co-star in episode two, and she was divinely beautiful, and I want to be just like her when I grow up. There you go. Um, what's the biggest misconception about the South? That we're racist. There's a lot of social justice in the yeah. South. Yeah, people sometimes see the Confederate flag and think that's the whole state, right? In, yeah. In one of the states. That... And, and a lot of the social justice movement was born in churches, some of them even evangelical. But I, I remember in particular associating the Methodist faith with um, racial justice in those communities. The instant backlash the president received. A lot of people who voted for him expected that he could change the world right away. Well, I do think that he promised transformational leadership, and when he went into office, he started to practice some transactional leadership. And so I'm among those who expected a little more, and I think that he's done a great job, and there are signs that the recovery, is, uh, the economic recovery is well underway, and you know, every month new jobs are being added. He inherited a mess, and he's handling it as well as anyone possibly could. Do you know all this stuff because in your show you're in the CIA? <laughs> I'm not CIA. Not really CIA, but are you? I'm a mother looking for <laughs> yeah, her son. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> you want to watch it. It's called Missing. Uh, it premieres on Thursday on CTV. Ashley Jett, everybody.